What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Daily Bible Reading Snapshot. Today we're looking at Genesis 12, 13, and 14 here in the Old Testament. And we are introduced to one of the key characters of the entire Bible, this guy named Abram. And his name is later going to be called Abraham. That's probably how you know him. But he is going to be really the center of the book of Genesis. Because after him, we're just going to see the story of his family. Which, remember, who are the people that are receiving this book? Well, it's the people of Israel who come from Israel, whose name was actually Jacob, whose dad name, whose dad was Isaac, whose dad was Abraham. So all of the identity that they have as a people comes through this guy named Abraham. And also we see here in Genesis chapter 12 that God makes promises to Abraham, which the people of Israel later on are supposed to base their hope and trust in. They have to say, God is faithful, he's kept his promises in the past, and I believe that God would keep his promises to Abraham, my forefather. That's what these Israelites were supposed to say when they received this book. And what are, what are, the, what are the promises? Well, first of all, he's promised to bless them and to make him a great nation so that he'll be great and he'll also be a blessing. He promises to bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you, I will curse. Now, if you're an Israelite, think about this. Who are the people that were dishonoring the children of Abraham? Well, if I'm an Israelite coming out of Egypt, I'm thinking, well, the Egyptians, they cursed the people of God. They were dishonoring people of God. They were dishonoring Abraham's family. Well, what does God say he's going to do to them? Well, he's going to curse them, which that's exactly what happened in history. And he also says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Also interesting that there's going to be this blessing that's going to extend to the whole world, even people from nations like Egypt that are going to be blessed later on, as we see today, that people are blessed through a descendant of Abraham named Jesus, which we're going to see all about him in the New Testament later on. But one other thing that I didn't mention here that's promised is he promises to give them a land, which I think that's important for these Israelites as they're entering this promised land. They need to remember that God already made a promise to give the land to Abraham. And later on, we're going to see right here where Abraham goes. So he leaves the city called Ur of the Chaldeans. He goes all the way over to the land that we know now as Israel. And he goes there. It's called the land of Canaan here, where the Canaanites were dwelling. It says between Bethel and Ai, he set up his tents. And he's going to come back later in chapter 13 to that same place. He's going to go down to Egypt for a little bit. And he's actually going to sin. So this guy named Abraham, although He's the center of the story. He's not a sinless guy. He walks with God, sure, but he has a lot of messed up decisions he makes. And one of them is to lie to the Pharaoh about his wife not being his wife. And that was bad. And God actually judges Pharaoh for being wrong in the way he treated Sarah. But also then God protects this family and he sends them back to the land of Israel. And it says that Abraham was very rich. Abram was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. And he set up his camp again between Bethel and Ai. And we're going to keep coming back to here. Even um, Jacob is going to come back to this, this same region later on in the book. But we'll get to that later. Point is, they were so big and they had so many um, camels and, and goats and whatever they had that Abraham actually had to split from people in his family. So there, there was one person that was with him named Lot, who was his nephew who traveled with him. They have to separate. So um, Lot goes down to the area where Sodom is down um, in the Jordan Valley. And it seems like we have Lot and Abraham separating at this point. So um, one goes south, one stays where they're at. And Abram actually has to go and rescue Lot because in chapter 14, all of these kings, and you're going to read them. So um, this might be a good day to listen to the daily Bible reading because there's a lot of names you probably don't come across every day. That these guys came in and fought against the king of Sodom and took all the people and all the livestock and all the stuff out of that city. And Lot was included in that. So Abram goes with his 318 guys that are born in his household. So he's got a lot of servants, a lot of people that work for him, a lot of shepherds that work with him, a lot of you know, masons and carpenters and whatever he had with him. They went down and they fought and they took back Lot, his nephew, and all his stuff. Then it says, as he was going away um, from this battle, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which Salem means peace, and we actually think that this is probably the region um, of Jerusalem. Interesting. Uh, this guy Melchizedek, which we see he's described in Hebrews chapter 7 as this prefigure of what Jesus is going to be like. It says, just like Melchizedek, we don't know much about, and Abram blesses uh, 
Melchizedek, and we recognize there's a differentiation where Abraham looks up to Melchizedek in the same way all the characters of the Old Testament look up to and respect Jesus because he is the, the high priest, just like it says Melchizedek is a king and a priest of the Most High God. So, interesting situation here. Abram gives 10% of all that he got to Melchizedek to bless him and to um, just to tell him how thankful he is that he blessed um, him through God, which that's what he does because he's a priest, right? He is a connection point between man and God. That's what a priest does. So interesting story with Melchizedek. You can read more about him in the book of Hebrews where um, there's certain things about Jesus that are like Melchizedek. I don't think Jesus is Melchizedek or Melchizedek is Jesus. I don't think that's what we're trying to get at. But the point is, very interesting character here in the Old Testament. Now, speaking of Jesus, we're looking here at the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. We're only looking at the beginning of Matthew 5 today because it is such a rich section of teaching that Jesus gives about what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And now a lot of these things we're going to see fulfilled in the future, but right now we're supposed to look at this Sermon on the Mount and think, okay, this is how I should live now. Even though I can't live perfectly to this, and he's even going to say, you've got to live totally righteously to be with God. And the point is we can't do that. In the meantime, we're supposed to live as righteous citizens of God's uh, future kingdom. So it says here, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, which doesn't make much sense. Blessed are those who mourn. That doesn't make much sense. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the merciful. Right? None of these seem to make sense. But the point is, Jesus is telling them, blessed are these people who do what is righteous now, and they hunger and thirst for righteousness because God will bless them in the end, which is an important principle for us to remember before God's kingdom comes, that in the meantime, we have to remember we got to live righteously. We have to live as God wants us to live. And it says, blessed are you even when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. And that word blessed means happy, but not just happy, more than happy, exceedingly happy, totally happy. And it says here that God promises to make his people who even suffer now happy later on when they're hungry and thirsty for the righteous thing. So that's the beginning of this. Then it says that God calls them salt and light. He says, God's people are like this. They're like salt and they're like light. What does that mean? Well, the salt in here in, in the New Testament, Jesus says you're supposed to be some type of preserving agent for the world. So the world does what's sinful, but you're supposed to be the righteous people in the world. Then he says, you're like a light because you're going to tell everybody this is the way to God. And you're supposed to point people back to Jesus. Then it says um, here in chapter 5, 17, he says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't sit, come to say the Old Testament was meaningless. I came to fulfill what the Old Testament was talking about. But it's impossible to enter the kingdom of God unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And I think he's pointing the spotlight to himself there and saying, I am the one who fulfills all righteousness. You can't even do it on your own. Then it says, Jesus explains this first section, which we're going to read verse 21 to verse 26 today, which is going to be a pattern that we're going to see later on. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. But the first thing is, is it's a pattern of you got the commandment in the Old Testament in this case, you shall not murder. And it, it means you shall not murder for sure. But the intention behind it was not only should you not murder, but you also shouldn't do what Cain and Abel did or what Cain did to Abel, which was hate him in his heart first, because that leads to the sin. So God in his law is not just calling out specific acts of sin. He's going down to the heart. And Jesus is not saying um, God said this, but what he, um, what, what he didn't say was this. He's saying, no, God always meant was this. And the point is, for us and for them, God hates it when we choose to not only murder, obviously that's bad, but also when we hate one another in our hearts. God says that's not okay. And what he says here is, what you got to do, if you got something against your brother or your brother has something against you, go and reconcile. And that hopefully is some helpful application. I know today it's like, whoa, I was like 12 different things from the Sermon on the Mount. That's how it's going to feel. But the point is, Jesus lays out very carefully here, this is what it looks like to live um, as one of God's people in a world that's not okay, in a world that is sinful. How should we live? Well, the Sermon on the Mount will tell us. So find something here today that you say, I want to apply that and put it into practice today as you leave. So thanks for reading. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.